Um, with chapter 13, I think one of the things, now that you guys have been through it, I think it kind of will help to <clears throat> kind of work backwards. Um, the whole purpose of this chapter, and you guys may or may not have noticed the trend since you've been working with IPS all year, but typically a chapter will build up to one big main idea. So it's like we take a little piece at a time and they kind of build this little storyline and they get you to this one big concept. So there's usually like one big main idea for every chapter. Chapter 13, the, the big idea is the law of conservation of energy. So basically the gist of it is that um, energy isn't created or destroyed. It simply changes form constantly, all day long in every interaction and everything we do. So all the pieces of this chapter are like the little, all the little pieces of this puzzle that then become the law of conservation of energy. So if we go, if we take that idea and the idea that um, if we have a certain amount of potential energy and we, like with lab 13.1, we have a certain amount of potential energy when the water bottle drops to the ground, the closer it gets to the ground, the less potential energy it has because one of the factors is distance. So as the distance decreases and it hits the ground, the potential energy doesn't just disappear, it's being converted to another kind of energy. In the case of 13.1, it's being con um, transformed into thermal energy. So all that potential energy in that water bottle as it falls is being transferred to thermal energy, which we're measuring through that cylinder and measuring the temperature of that cylinder. So if you, I like work, I kind of like working backwards sometimes because then it sort of helps to piece it all together. Like why did we do this lab in the first place? Well, the reason we start with this lab is really to start building that, the case to support the whole law of conservation of energy. So if we go back to 13.1, and they actually don't even necessarily start this particular lab by making that comparison between thermal and potential energy. They don't do that until section two, when we get to section two. So really, every section is like one little tiny piece of the puzzle. And if we, let, if we take a step back for a second, you guys are used to, if you think about all the science you've done up till now, you have a science textbook and they'll give you a definition. Here's gravitational potential energy. Here's how you calculate it. Here's what it is. Okay, now go do some calculations. What IPS does instead is they take this one big concept and they spend a whole chapter trying to prove to you that the law of conservation of energy is, in, tr in truth, a law of nature. So every little piece along the way is really just like, okay, here's another little bit of evidence to get us to this. And their ho the whole point in the way they write this, and we'll talk about it, is to prove it to you. Now, in most science, you're just used to going, okay, if you tell me that's the law of conservation of energy, I'll just believe you. This book is like, let me prove it to you. Let me show you how. I'm going to walk you all these steps that seem so confusing in the moment. And the whole point is to say, let me prove it to you. Here's why this is what it is. So we start with, in chapter 13, they start with um, this lab, heating produced by a slowly falling object. They don't even bring up gravitational potential energy yet, but in retrospect, that's really what's going on. So you have the water bottle, and it has a certain mass, and it's a dis certain distance from the ground. And so if you, and again, they don't have the, you don't, they haven't presented the formula for you yet, but really, if you could calculate it. You could calculate how much gravitational potential energy that water bottle has by measuring its mass, measuring its distance, and then applying that formula, okay? When, as it drops, the closer it gets to the ground, it's not necessarily losing gravitational potential energy because it doesn't ever get lost. It's just the gravitational potential energy decreases. And as it decreases, the thermal energy is increasing. And it's always a one-to-one -one ratio because we don't lose energy. If, we're, if, the Jeep, if the gravitational potential energy is decreasing as it falls, it's going somewhere. Where's it going? In this case, it's being transferred to the aluminum cylinder because of the friction between the fishing wire and the cylinder. And then we can record the temperature and see how much it's changed and calculate, well, how much thermal energy was transferred to the cylinder, okay? Now, in this particular lab, all they're trying to get you to see is the relationship between the mass of the bottle and then how much thermal energy is created. So, let me see, I think I have some sample data that we can look at really quick. 
Um, actually, here's the yeah, here's the sample data from the book. So I don't know if you guys, I'm not sure what data you guys saw when you did this, but if we look over here at net falling mass, this is the mass of the water bottle. And then the distance we keep constant, because in this particular lab, this is the independent variable. We want to see how does the mass of the water bottle affect, in the end, the amount of thermal energy that's created. And again, it's not really created, it's just transferred, that's all. So we alter this, but we keep the distance constant. And then we record the initial temperature of the cylinder and the final temperature to figure out how much the temperature goes up. And then we can apply the formula for thermal energy, which probably should have a pen. Let me grab a pen. Okay, so the formula for, um, I like to say change in thermal energy. That little triangle means change. I don't know if you guys have seen that before. It's a delta symbol. You'll see it when you get into like high school physics more. So to calculate a change in thermal energy, you have to multiply the mass of the object that we're talking about, in this case the aluminum cylinder, times the change in temperature of the aluminum cylinder times its specific heat. Now I don't know if you got how much you guys know about specific heat. Um, I th the everyday way of explaining it is that um, specific heat basically indicates how well an object can lose or gain energy. Okay. Um, so if you think about metals, for example, if I add energy to a metal, the temperature goes up really fast. So if you think about a pot of boiling water on the stove, you fill up the pot, you put it on the stove, you turn on the energy source. So energy is being added to the pot of water. If you think about it, if you've ever done it, probably, hopefully you have at some point, or at least seen it, the metal pot gets really hot really fast because it does not take a lot of energy to heat it up. You add a little bit of energy and the temperature of that metal goes way up really fast. The water in the pot, however, which is essentially getting the exact same amount of energy that the pot is because we're adding energy to the whole system, it takes forever for the water to heat up. We have to dump tons and tons and tons of energy into the water to finally get its temperature to go up. That's what specific heat is. It's specific to a substance. It's a characteristic property. So every substance is affected by energy differently. Some of them heat up really, really fast. Some of them take forever. Like if you've ever had to heat your pool, if you have a pool at home and you have to heat it, you've got to turn on that heat, heat pump like three days before you want to use the pool because it takes so long to get the temperature of the water to go up. So things like water have a really, really high specific heat, which just means it takes a lot of energy to get the temperature to go up. Metals, on the other hand, have a very low specific heat because it doesn't take a whole lot to get the temperature to go up. So when we're talking about um, thermal energy, the thermal energy of an object, we have to take into account what that object is and how energy affects it. That's where this comes from. That's why this is one of those factors. And then, of course, we multiply that times how much did the temperature go up times how much do we have, right? If I have a little teeny bit of water versus a pool full of water, that's certainly going to affect how much thermal energy I need to add to change the temperature. So we have to take mass into account as well. Um, I do want to point out one thing, and this occurred with every one of my kids last year and a lot of kids this year. We just talked about this the other day. When they're looking at their data and it's time to go ahead and calculate a change in thermal energy and they see the formula and they see mass, change in temperature, specific heat, we give them the specific heat. We say, okay, it's 900 joules per, how did they do, what unit did they use? I think it's, is it kilograms? I forget. I think it's kilograms. Well, but this is in grams. Either way, we'll just say 900. Depending on if it's kilograms or grams, it would be 0.9 or it would be 900, either way. So we give them the specific heat. And then you can look at the change in temperature, and that's great. And you go, okay, well, the change in temperature is, let's say, 0.75. Then they see mass, and they look at the data table, and they automatically go here. And they use this mass. Here's the problem with that. We're calculating a change in thermal energy of the aluminum. So we need the mass of the aluminum, not the mass of the water bottle, right? The mass of the water bottle has nothing to do with how much thermal, well, it does have something to do with it, but 
it's, it's related in a different way. When we're calculating the change in thermal energy of the aluminum, these factors all have to be about the aluminum. So what we needed, and, and I, it's so funny because I did this with my kids the other day, and I, right before we did the calculations, I'm like, You're, what are we going to need to know to calculate this? Okay, we need the mass of the aluminum. And I gave them the mass, 0 0.015 kilograms. So this must be kilograms, joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. So I gave them the mass. I gave them the specific heat. Five seconds later when they're calculating it, they go to this mass. Because they see mass and they see mass and they just throw it in there without really thinking about it. That's where you have to think about what, what, how are these related and what am I trying to do and what am I trying to accomplish. This is the thermal energy of the aluminum. So all of these factors have to be about the aluminum. So having said that, um, the whole purpose of this lab was to get you to see how the mass of the water bottle affects the change in thermal energy of the aluminum. Okay, so what we did was after we did all the data, we graph it, and here's a sample graph. Um, and what you should notice, obviously, is it's a proportionality. As the mass of the water bottle gets heavier and heavier and heavier, it's going to generate more thermal energy in the aluminum, which kind of makes sense, right? If it's heavier, it's going to create more, as it falls, it's going to create more friction, more heat, more change in temperature, more thermal energy. So that's a pretty obvious connection, I think, by the time we get to the end of this particular lab. They still haven't mentioned gravitational potential energy. So that's where, again, with this particular course, they really take it in baby steps to build the case a little tiny bit at a time. So we end 13.1 with this relationship, okay? Um, let's look at some REEs, since I said we would do that, and I've been talking now for like 10 minutes. Okay. It says, suppose you arrange the apparatus in 13.1 so that it takes the object 10 minutes to reach the floor. What rise in temperature would you expect to find? The issue here and in the, in the, the key part of this question is how long it takes. If that thing fell, first of all, let's think about how long 10 minutes is. That thing would have to be, I mean, it would, it would feel like a million years if that thing was falling for 10 full minutes, just that short distance from the ground. So. If it took that long to fall, any, any heat generated by the friction and the wire, we would lose it to the air. So if you think about energy and how it works, and I don't want to say lose necessarily because the law of conservation of energy says we don't lose energy, it just gets transferred somewhere. So if, it took te if we let it fall so slowly, what would end up happening is the friction that's created would create heat and that heat, because it's falling so slowly, would just transfer out to the air and wouldn't necessarily reflect on the thermometer. So part of this lab was making sure that it falls slowly, but not so slow that we don't, that we lose the heat to the air. Okay, so that's the purpose of this question is just to get you to understand that the time factor is important. We don't want it to fall so crazy fast. Um, because we do need time for that friction to be to be reflected in the thermometer, but we don't want it to fall so slow that we basically lose the heat and it gets transferred to the air. Does that make sense? That help? Okay. Suppose that the aluminum cylinder had twice the mass of the cylinder that you used. How would this affect the rise in temperature in your experiment? Um, let me think about that. So if we have, we have mass times change in temperature. The friction would be spread over twice the matter, basically. So it would probably result in a change in temperature about half of what it should be. Let me just, sometimes I like to look up the answer to make sure I'm right. But that's kind of what I'm thinking. If we have to take the thermal energy that's being created and spread it over twice the mass, it'll probably result in the temperature being only going up by half as much. Does that make sense? If you think about spreading energy or heat. Hi. If you Oh, yeah. I don't even know what happens. I was busy too busy emailing people. Um, let me just verify that. Just to make sure I'm giving you correct information. Yeah, exactly. So if we have twice the mass, we'd expect the temperature to only go up half as much. Because it, in, in effect, if you think about the formula again, 
the amount of thermal energy that's being transferred to the aluminum is exactly the same regardless, right? So if we look at this formula, let's do this again, mass times change in temperature times specific heat. That's one factor there. Okay, so if the amount of thermal energy that's being added to the aluminum is the same no matter what, then if this goes up by twice the amount, then this has to go down by half the amount in order to keep that constant. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, how would your experimental results have been affected by each of the following? You began with the temperature of the aluminum cylinder a degree or two above room temperature. Okay, this is the part that I didn't focus on as much with my kids when we did it, um, and I'm not sure how it was presented to you guys, but one of the important things in this lab was to keep to, because um, you did trial after trial, right, to maybe three, four, five trials. Um, so once you do one trial, the temperature goes up. You need to wait for the aluminum to come back down again. And so what we had our, what we normally have our kids do is take a little piece of ice in a bag and kind of just touch it to kind of bring it back down to room temperature so that we're starting from room temperature again. So if we don't allow it to go all the way back to room temperature, um, let's see, it's a degree or two above room temperature when we start. It's, it's definitely going to affect the change in temperature in some way. It probably will show the change in temperature to be not quite as much as it would have been normally. Let's see. It means the cylinder would constantly be losing. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So um, <clears throat> if it doesn't go all the way back down to room temperature, what's happening is while we're running the experiment, the aluminum is still trying to get back to room temperature because that's just the nature of objects that are at different temperatures. If the aluminum is higher than the room, it's giving away heat to the air until they reach an equilibrium. Okay? And if we start out with it above room temperature, that aluminum cylinder, while we're running the experiment, is still giving away heat to the air because that's just a law of nature. That's just what happens. It's thermodynamics. It's just going to tr keep transferring it to the air. So the change in temperature that we would record would be a little bit less than what it should be. So it would affect our change in temperature, which would, if you look at the calculation, would affect how much thermal energy um, we calculated for that particular part. And then if you forgot to subtract the mass of the counterweight from the mass of the container. Okay, so we what they were looking for, and if you look at the sample data, that's why it says net falling mass, because we use the counterweights to slow down the fall of the bottle so that it would go at a you know, consistently slower speed. Um, so we would take the mass of the bottle with the water and then subtract the counterweight so that we know exactly how much is falling because, you know, it's counteracting it, so we have to subtract it to figure out how, what the actual falling mass would be. So if we didn't subtract the counterweights, then all of these numbers would be bigger than what they should be. And let's look at the graph. If all of these numbers were bigger than what they should be, then all of these points would be shifted up here a little bit. Does that make sense? So it would, um, it would just show it, in the end, it would just show a different proportionality constant. It would, it would still be a direct relationship um, because it would still start at zero, zero, but the numbers would kind of shift this way. So the line would be a little bit steeper. So you would come up with a different proportionality constant that way. If, you had, if, if what I'm saying isn't clear, please ask. You can ask anytime. Um, okay, number four. How would your experimental results have been affected if you had used the same volume, I love when they do this, the same volume of candle oil instead of water, the same volume of candle oil? Well, I don't know. Let's see. Let's say the, the density of candle oil is 0.76. So let me see. 0.76, that's grams per cubic centimeter compared to one gram per cubic centimeter. If these are the same, we would probably need more candle oil if we use the same volume of candle oil. So if we use, let's see, if we use one here and one here, the mass would be less. So if we, how would your exper experimental results have been affected if you use the same volume of candle oil? Well, the mass would be less, but I'm not sure where they're going with that. Because the, because the density of candle oil is less, um, water is one gram per cubic centimeter, so if we use the same cubic centimeters, it's gonna, the candle oil will have less, less mass per cubic centimeter, so the overall mass would be less. But wouldn't we weigh that and account for that? 
so I don't know that that makes a difference really. Um, since it's a little bit Okay. I guess what they're trying to say is that um, for the same falling distance, the increase in thermal energy will be 0.76 the value of the water. This que a question like this doesn't even come up on the test. I don't know why they have to be so tricky like this. Um, I guess because it's less mass per cubic centimeter than the relationship between the mass of the, the bottle with candle oil versus the mass of the bottle with water would be 0.76 compared to one of the water. So the relationship instead of like a one to one would be like 0.76 to one just because of that density. That's what they're getting at. That might be a little trickier than is necessary. Okay. So then we get into 13.2. Now they talk about gravitational potential energy. So we do this whole experiment, which again, I would really rather see them say, okay, here's gravitational potential energy. Let's see how gravitational potential energy converts to thermal energy. But they take it, again, just a step at a time. They're like, let's look at mass versus thermal energy first. And then they're gonna use that to prove to you or to sell you on the whole idea of gravitational potential energy. Now, just, just so you guys have background, and I don't know how you guys have been, how the readings have been explained to you before. The reason they go through all of this and all of this, the whole point is to build the case for the formula for gravitational potential energy. They're trying to prove to you at every step along the way why the formula is what it is. That's the whole point of the reading. So it's, I don't know that it's purposely confusing, but it's confusing because you're not used to that. You're not used to a science text trying to prove to you why something is what it is. You're just used to being told, here's what it is, and just believe me because I told you that's what it is, right? So this whole, all of this is just to get to, oh, where'd it go? The formula, oh, here it is, the formula for gravitational potential energy. I, let's see, I've got notes. I made my own notes that I think are way more easy to understand. I've got stacks of paper everywhere. Here we go. Let's see. Okay, 13.2. Okay. Um, so here's what they do. I'm going to give you my version of it. And I'll, I'll post these for you guys on Edmodo too. Um, okay, so we learned in 13.1 that the increase in thermal energy of the aluminum is, is proportional to the mass. Okay, so we get that. As long as we keep distance constant. So everybody drop the bottle from the same point. So that's what we learned in 13.1. Now we're going to apply it here. So really the next part of the reading says, okay, so how does it depend on the falling distance? Okay, we kept distance constant and we altered the mass. What would happen if we kept mass constant and altered the distance? Um, to find out, we could do the same experiment, but instead of varying the mass, we would vary the distance. So it would be the same exact experiment over again, but everybody would have the same amount of water, and but each person, each group would drop it from a different distance, that's all, just to see how it, it's affected. And then they give you data in 13.4. So if this is the distance, I don't know why they can't just say distance, but they say vertical fall of the container. So if you change the distance, you also get this proportional relationship to thermal energy. So the further you drop it from the ground, the more thermal energy it's going to create, which makes sense if you already know about gravitational potential energy, which they haven't gotten to yet. But if you think about gravitational potential energy, the further it is from the ground, the more potential energy it has, just because that's how gravitational potential energy works. So if an object's being dropped from here, and we keep the mass constant, versus an object being dropped from all the way down here, the one way up here, has more gravitational potential energy, which means as it falls, it has more energy to transfer to the aluminum, which means the aluminum is going to gain more thermal energy from an object dropped up here compared to an object dropped down here. So for the bottles that were really close to the ground, these bottles dropped from this distance don't have a lot of energy to transfer, and so they don't transfer as much energy. These bottles, because they're much further from the ground, have a lot more energy to transfer, and therefore they transfer a lot more thermal energy to the cylinder. Again, the whole point of them going through this is to say, hey, guess what? Distance is also a factor. 
Instead of just telling you that, they're trying to prove it to you. So they go through all this to prove to you distance is a factor. So then basically they come up with these two ideas. They said, if the falling distance is constant, well, let me just paraphrase this. Basically, the two factors involved are distance and mass. If we keep mass constant and alter the distance, there's a proportional relationship. If we keep distance constant and alter mass, there's a proportional relationship. So the mass of that bottle and the distance that it falls are both directly proportional to how much thermal energy it creates. You guys with me on that? Makes sense? They're both directly proportional. So if they're both directly proportional, their product must also be directly proportional. So here we have thermal energy on this side. So think aluminum cylinder. And then we have mass, which is proportional. And we have distance, which is, propor with the, which is proportional. So their product must also be proportional, okay? So then we go, well, why the heck is there this constant? Basically, um, because, I, I just like to look at it this way. If you look at the graph, there is a constant rate of change. So if you divide the two, you can figure out what that constant is. Which, by the way, is the slope of the line, right? Rise over run, okay? So because there's pro this proportional relationship, you can figure out the slope of the line to figure out what the constant is. So that's basically what they're getting at next. So if we, if we take th the increase in thermal energy and divide it by mass times distance, we come up with whatever this constant is, which turns out to be about 9.8. Okay. Um, you guys need to know the characteristics of a proportionality. You definitely need to know that for 14, I believe. Um, and it, obviously you learn it in 13. There's two things. First, it's a straight line, right? It's a constant rate of change. And it starts at the origin. That's like the one piece that they don't directly state. Actually, do they directly state that? I'm not sure if they do. I think I started doing that because that was where people were getting confused because they don't, they don't come out and directly state it. Hi, guys. Um, so... The two characteristics of a proportionality are that it starts at the origin and then there's a constant rate of change. Hi, what's up? Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, so then they go through, and again, they're just trying to prove this to you all along the way. They could just say, they could take this whole section and in one line go, here's the formula for gravitational potential energy. But they're proving it, proving it, proving it. Here's why it is what it is. So then we can calculate the proportionality constant. We can go, okay, this divided by this, we get 9.8. And again, they're just all they're doing in this section is building up to what the formula is. We can use this equation, it says, to define a new form of energy, which you're probably already familiar with, gravitational potential energy. So what they are saying is, as the object falls to the ground and gravitational potential energy decreases, it is causing an increase in thermal energy of the aluminum. So as one goes down, the other goes up, right? Because we said that energy, and again, this is where we sometimes begin with the end in sight. If we talk about the whole point of this chapter, the law of conservation of energy, as one decreases, it has to be going somewhere because we don't just lose it. It's being transferred somewhere to some other kind of form of energy. In this case, thermal energy. So as one goes down, another form is going up. As the other one goes down, the other one is going up. It's like a one, it should be, theoretically, a one-to-one. -one. If I have 10 joules of, en of gravitational potential energy, and that goes down to zero when it hits the ground, then that 10 joules of energy should be transferred to the aluminum cylinder. That's really the gist in the end of this whole entire chapter. And then they get into kinetic in a minute. So, blah, 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 here's your formula. So, gravitational potential energy. Here's our constant, and they showed you how to figure that out. We talked about how mass is proportional. We talked about how distance is proportional. And so that's the whole story on how they come up with that formula. See how they make it a little bit more confusing? What they try to do, again, is pr to prove to you. They want you to be saying, well, why is that? Why is that? Why is that at all times? And so with that in mind, they're trying to prove to you so that you believe it. You go, okay, now I understand why that is what it is. Now I get why that is what it is. Instead of just saying, here's a formula. You know what I mean? So it's it involving our minds a little bit more and why the formula is what it is. That is what section two is all about. So, two more REEs. A one gallon bottle of water has a mass of four grams. 
how much gravitational potential energy does the bottle gain if it is lifted the following distances? This is simply a matter of plugging in the variable. So if the formula is 9.8 times mass times distance, so whatever that turns out to be. I'm just going to read them out of here. Let's see. For the first one, let's see, it would be 9.8 times 4 times 1, which gives us 40 joules of energy. For part B, it would be 9.8 times 4 times 2, which would give us 80 joules of energy. And then the, for the last one, 9.8 times 4 times 10 would give us 400 joules of energy, which again just proves the further it is from the ground, the more energy it has. And then six, which gains more gravitational potential energy? A four kilogram object lifted three meters or a five kilogram object lifted two meters. So really you just calculate both. For the first one it would be 9.8 times four times three. And then you would compare that to 9.8 times five times two. And so let's see how that works out. Um, for the first one, 9.8 times four times three gives us 120 joules of energy. And then for the five kilogram object, it's 9.8 times five times two, and that gives us 98 joules of energy. So this one, the first one, would give us more gravitational potential energy. So these two, I mean, you know how some of the REs can be like crazy, ridiculously hard. Those are just giving you practice at calculating gravitational potential energy. So that's that. Um, hmm. I guess we should probably stop there because of the time. Um, why don't we do tom tomorrow, we can plan on, because I've given you guys a lot of the background now, we can get through 13.3 and 4. 13.3 and 13.4 are basically two parts to lead us up to the formula for kinetic energy. So if you keep that storyline in mind, how they're trying to prove to you all along the way, all 13.3 and 13.4 do is to prove to you this, the formula for kinetic energy. So we can go through that tomorrow, um, and then we can talk about that lab and how, because and then the lab is how we apply it. Again, this one really quick. The whole point, if we go back to the the big idea of the law of conservation of energy, changing gravitational energy to kinetic energy. If we can calculate, if, did you guys do the spinning wheel with the thing? Okay, that's always a fun one. If we, if you know what's going on, um, <laughs> we have gravitational potential energy here. In the bottle of water, we can calculate it. How, what's the mass? How far is it from the ground? Times 9.8. So this bottle has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. Okay. So then we let it drop to the ground. And as it hits the ground, now its gravitational potential energy is zero. Where did all that energy go? It went into making the wheel spin, which is the energy of motion. So let's say that we started with 1,000 joules of gravitational potential energy. By the time it hits the ground, zero joules of gravitational potential energy, but all of that thousand should be now the kinetic energy of the wheel. So if you time the wheel and you do mass times speed, you know, um, half the mass times the speed squared, and you calculate it, you should find that one-to-one -one ratio. Gravitation, all that gravitational potential energy will be transferred to kinetic. That's the whole point of that lab as well, but we can talk through that a little bit more. Um, and we'll do some more REEs tomorrow. <coughs> okay, sound good? Okay. Let me find my clicker. If you guys have questions about anything I talked about or anything going on in your classes right now, um, just you can Edmo 